I wonder how many of us have helped somebody come to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ this year? Have you helped anybody become a Christian this year? We shouldn't all have the same gifts in that respect. But I do suggest to you that many more of us ought to be leading people to Christ. And I think it ought to be a real heartache. And perhaps it is for you a real heartache. Sometimes I talk to folk because they think maybe they've got a missionary call and they come to talk to me because they think that's sort of something I get excited about and that's dead right. And I say, oh, so you want to go there to lead people to Christ. Do you? Are you leading people to Christ here in Glasgow? And they look a bit surprised and a bit embarrassed. And they say, well, not really. And you say, well, if you're not leading people to Christ in Glasgow, do you think somehow it's going to become easier when you're speaking Japanese that you don't know? But we do have this, this big problem, don't we? About being people that are helping others to really come to Christ. You see, as I read my New Testament, it seems to me that in the New Testament, evangelism was largely personal evangelism and home evangelism. Not usually bringing people to church to hear a preacher. And I believe we need to learn about it and to get on with it. And here in the passage that David read to us from Acts chapter 8 that you'll need to turn to, we have a lovely example of spirit-led witness that resulted in an African being one for Christ. And the evangelist was certainly not an African. Philip and the Ethiopian Chancellor of Exchequer. And I want to look at this chapter tonight, or rather this part of the chapter tonight, and ask quite simply, what was Philip's secret? What sort of man was he to be used like that? Last week, you remember, we focused particularly on this guy called Simon Magus. He was, I think, a believer still very much in the grip of his old lifestyle. And that happens a lot, doesn't it? And we were challenged not to go his way. Because, you see, the result of someone who's with the believers, whose lifestyle is basically just as it was before he made his decision, is there written for us in verse 21. You have no part or share in this ministry. And that's true, isn't it? That if our lives don't basically look any different from the life of the average unbeliever, what sort of ministry can we have to the lost? And we need to beware because, you see, as with Simon, so often with us, the old life hangovers, as I put it, often wreck ministry. If you became a Christian later in life, there was probably quite a lot of muck there already that still tries to cling. And that was true for Simon. And although he had made a decision, his life was still so much around the old values, where was the ministry? He was told quite straight, there isn't a ministry when you're like that. It should incidentally remind us that when we hear stories of massive people movements around the world, to realise that that's not the end of our praying, but the beginning. Because there are a lot of old hangovers that hang around. Pagan hangovers. Even in British Christians. Pagan hangovers 
that wreck our witness and ministry. But in contrast here tonight, we see Philip, a believer really under the control of the Spirit. And the result was real ministry, wasn't it? We saw that last week in verses 5 to 8, don't we? Where Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there and the crowds heard Philip and they saw the miraculous signs he did. They all paid, paid close attention to what he said. People are delivered and healed. And verse 8, so there was great joy in the city. And the same we find at the end of this interview with the Ethiopian. He went on his way rejoicing. One of the very restrained translations, I think it's the New English Bible, which is very sort of restrained, polite English translation, says he went on his way well content. Which is a gross understatement, like saying, well, it's not too bad. He went on his way rejoicing, because here was a spirit-filled man with a God-honoured witness. And we want to get to the secret of that. How did it show that Philip was spirit-controlled? I want to suggest to you three things tonight, which I hope we'll get through. Firstly, he was prepared to go from the spectacular. Secondly, he was sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit. And thirdly, he was competent to explain Scripture. I give you the headings now because my wife sometimes says she doesn't understand how I can have such orderly notes and be such a chaotic preacher. You may not get those headings again, but that's what they are. And we're going to begin with the first one. He was prepared to go from the spectacular. You see him there in verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, notice how Luke rubs it in, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. But you know what's been going on in Samaria where he's been preaching? There's been a revival. And they're just tumbling in, falling over one another to come and hear this fabulous preacher, Philip. And then the Spirit says, go off down into the desert. And he doesn't say, well, as a matter of fact, I'm rather an important preacher and everybody wants to hear me these days. Now we see here a dramatic contrast between Simon Majors and Philip. Simon was always desperate to be where the action was. And we see that in verse 13. Simon himself believed and was baptised and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished at the great signs and miracles he saw. Philip, in contrast, says, if the Lord calls to the desert, I'll go. A few weeks ago I was wandering around a town in central Thailand called Payuha with a guy from Sandiford Henderson Church called Bob Trelogan. He and his wife Jan have worked there for many years. They're generally referred to as the Trogs, for those who know them. And Trog took me around in Paiuha. Central Thailand has a population the same as Scotland, and it has about as many Christians as we've got in church tonight, including the nominals. Paiuha meets, I've got a photograph of it at home, in a grotty little wooden shack, the church. Very few. I went round the town with Trog. First of all, we climbed the steps up to the big temple in the centre of the town, and while we were there, we met a young Buddhist monk. I don't know what his real name was. His nickname was Benz, as in Mercedes. And we shared for quite a long time with Benz about his longings and ambitions and about Jesus. He wasn't remotely interested. Then we went on a little further and I noticed that there was a tree with a sort of what looked to a western mind, a sort of little doll's house attached to the front of it. So I said, oh, what's all that about? He said, let's ask the folk that live around here. They said, well, there was a big tree here. 
but we had to chop it down because it was dangerous to the traffic and after we chopped it down there was this person in this person in this house here saw the lady spirit of the tree go out and she was absolutely furious so we planted a weed tree and stuck this thing up because we do want to make sure that that lady spirit is not offended with us and we talked to them about Jesus and about the way that he delivers from that sort of horrible bondage and nobody was interested and so we went round the corner a bit and there was this fabulous new Chinese shrine and it had got I don't know what on it and all of it covered in gold and they said oh yes we had a fabulous ceremony here recently and somebody had a spear put through his cheek and through his tongue and out through the other side and all the rest of it and he said would you like to come and see the video it's three hours long but I'm sure you'd love to see it he said to me and we said well why have you built this fantastic new shrine and they said well because it's good for business because if we make the offerings there we will get the profits then we told them about Jesus and no one was interested and I thought to myself why on earth go for years and years and years and throw in your career as a good vet because they won't allow him, the government there won't allow him to be a vet and an evangelist so he'd rather be an evangelist because that has eternal significance why go into a desert like that? no interest, no interest, no interest and as we sat down to pray that night there was a knock at the door and there was a young elder called Prasit after Prasit had been converted he'd been framed for armed robbery that he hadn't committed and he was sentenced to 18 years in jail in chains after two years after he'd evangelized most of the people in the prison and the other one they moved him to in the Lord's goodness he was released and Prasit and his wife and the two kids came round and for two and a half hours we talked about Jesus together and we prayed together it's hard to pray by interpretation but it's very precious with somebody like that and you say why go out into the desert and you looked at that man and you understood here why take Philip out of the revival in Samaria and send him into the desert the answer is simple because the Lord wanted an African and we can very easily say oh but I want to be where the action is I've been meditating on this and thinking what does this mean I think for many of us Christians attendance at all the lively meetings may sometimes be pure escapism we need sometimes to go into the desert where there aren't any Christians to stand for Christ and to have enough time in our schedule for the unbelievers to meet with them where it's desert and of course I'm especially bothered about the rest of the world people sometimes say to me oh Dick you always talk about the unevangelized I read in Transworld Radio Communique this spring an interesting account it said this in the course of 1986 more than 54 million people died it's estimated that half of them died without having heard even once a clear presentation of the gospel in a language and cultural sense setting which was meaningful to them comes down to 51 people per minute most certainly entering eternity without Christ almost one every second of every day if one considers the rate at which worldwide population is growing the picture becomes increasingly tragic and people always say to me oh yes but Dick there's a lot to do in Britain shall I tell you something in Britain there are 47,000 Protestant churches and between them between them they have sent out 5,800 career missionaries that on average is less than one missionary sent long term to plant churches overseas for every eight congregations I'm not asking that we empty the churches of Britain that is desperately in need of the gospel but one is longing that more would go to the desert where half of the world's population 
can't go round the corner to a church where there's Bibles and need to hear. But the desert may be in your office as well. He was prepared to go from the spectacular for the sake of the lost. Secondly, we see about Philip, he was sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit. In verse 26 it says, An angel of the Lord said to Philip. And in verse 29 it says, The Spirit told Philip. And on both occasions Philip obeyed at once. It's lovely, isn't it? Now what sort of guidance is this? I'll have to take my coat off or I won't be able to see because my glasses are steaming up. What sort of guidance is this that we have spoken about here? But firstly, let's look at the voice of an angel. Now there's an important question that we have to ask in terms of this voice of an angel. And that question is, was it a heavenly being or an earthly one? Now that's not a liberal question because the word angel is used by Luke in a variety of ways. For example, back in Luke chapter 7 and at verse 24, I I work from the NIV paraphrase and some of you may have other translations, but you will notice there in verse 24 of Luke chapter 7, after John's messengers left, it says, but the word is angels. And then we hear the prophecy about John the Baptist in verse 27. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. The word again is angel. But under no stretch of the imagination can we call John the Baptist or his mates angels. But in each of these cases they were messengers or envoys. Now it's not very clear here because Luke in this very quiet sort of way doesn't he give us the details it just actually says a messenger from the Lord told him to go not much is made of how the message came but it's quite clear that it was a personal word to Philip and he was sure that it was the Lord and he had to go now I was discussing this and trying to think it through a bit with my wife I reckon that in more than a combined total of 50 years of Christian experience we've only once known any dealing with an angel and we're not quite sure whether that was one anyway. The Lord does sometimes speak through angels. He often speaks through messengers or envoys as the word means. And the way that you can be used evangelistically may well come to you through someone else bringing that idea into your head. There was the voice of an angel. And secondly, there was the the leading of the Spirit in verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. When I had finished in Paiuha in central Thailand, I took the bus uh, in considerable fear and trembling that I was going to get lost and eventually turned up at Ian and Isabel's place in Bangkok. And the next day uh, they decided that it was probably time for me to do some cramming because I was going to catch the plane the following day off to Brunei and I had rather more preaching to do there than made sense. So they gave me an air-conditioned room in the office next to the OMF mission home in Bangkok. And I sat down to start cramming. And after a little while in this rather comfortable air-conditioned office, I felt very strongly, you have no business to be here. Get up and go outside. I couldn't explain it but there was no way that I was going to get any more work done because I had this strong compulsion that I was to get up and go outside over to the mission house. So I did. 
And when I arrived there, there was a young Canadian student whom I had met in January when I was ministering at the Ontario Bible College there. He said, oh, hello, how lovely to see you. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, after the mission week that you were preaching, I decided I'd better come and have a look-see. So I made all the arrangements to come here and I'm arrived, but nobody here has the foggiest idea what I'm here for and I'm scared out of my wits. I thought, well, praise the Lord, I'm here for that bloke. If I had finished my preparation, I'd have missed him. He went in the hour. So we shared and we prayed, and he was reassured. As he popped off, another fellow came out and somebody said, oh, do you know so-and-so? I said, no. I said, where's he from? He said, oh, he's been working in South Thailand. So I said to him, is it as grotty down there as everybody says? He began to open up and to share about all the terrible traumas that that missionary had been through in trying to reach those million Muslims for Christ, the Malay speakers. And as we shared together, he said to me, Dick, please will you pray for me? Because he had got to the point where it was very difficult for him to pray for him. And so I did, and the Lord set him free to begin to pray a bit after that. And then he started to cry. And boy, is how that man needed to cry. And I don't know, one young guy who was lost on the other side of the world, one missionary to Muslims at the end of his tether, and yet I had to say that as I sat down to prepare for ministry in Brunei, it was almost an audible voice, get up and go outside. And one could see why. I think of a colleague of mine in the Philippines who once came to my wife and said, Rose, I think I'm going out of my mind, but do you think God could be calling me to Mexico? I can't get Mexico out of my mind. She said, I don't know anything about Mexico. Have you got any National Geographics that I can borrow to find out about the place? And the Spirit was speaking to her in response to an American's prayer in Mexico City who when the Lord had said to him, why keep praying for an American, why not anybody from anywhere, had said, okay Lord, give me a fellow worker from anywhere. And a week later the girl came to my wife and said, for a week I haven't been able to get Mexico out of my mind. The Spirit speaks. The leading of the Spirit is the second element in the guidance of Philip here. And I want to make one or two points about this that I think are important. The first one is this. Knowing God is more than knowing God's book. Knowing God is more than knowing God's book. The Holy Spirit is alive and he is active today. He does not just guide through the Bible, though he always guides consistent with the Bible. There is no verse in Philip's Old Testament to say, go to that chariot. There was no verse in the Bible that said to me, go out of the office. Now we need to think about this because some of us have almost tried to destroy the Holy Spirit because we're scared stiff of folk who in a wrong sort of way use the expression, the Lord said to me. We all know of blokes who've turned up in girls' doorsteps and said, God has told me you're to be my wife and the girl looks rather scared out of her wits and feels that she's saying no not only to the bloke but to the living God. It is open to abuse. And that is why we need to obey, to weigh every prompting against the scriptures. They are the objective guide to keep us on the straight and narrow. 
But we are called Galatians 5 to be led by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit. And we urgently need, I urgently need to cultivate such a personal relationship with God because he's alive. The second thing that I want to say in relation to this guidance is that Simon concentrated on having God's power, Philip concentrated on doing God's will. Do you notice the difference? There in verse 19, Simon says, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Philip in contrast, in verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, Go, then Philip ran. There's a totally different mindset. You talk to people and you say to people sometimes, will you go and share the gospel with somebody? And they say, oh, when I've had some sort of real experience of the power of God, then I'll feel that I can go. That's Simon mentality. You give me the oomph and I'll give the blessing. Of course it's all back to front because the Lord loves to use, what does he call it, clay pots? Paul says, praise the Lord, I'm weak, because when I'm weak, he's strong. It's the power of God that is shown in weakness. I'm there in fear and trembling. God's there in power. What's all this business about? The people may be converted to God, not to Dick Dowsett. And Simon wants people to be converted to Simon. And so he's not prepared to obey. All he wants is more power. It's the same mindset that we find so often in the church where people come trotting into the church in order to get blessed for themselves. And they wonder why God won't endorse their selfishness. It isn't bless me, bless me mindset in the New Testament. The Spirit of God turns us from ourselves. And since Pentecost, when the Spirit was given to the Church of God. You have the power if only you switch on the engine to go somewhere. You have the power if only you switch on to work. And that is what Philip believed. So there's no question about getting power when the Spirit says, Go. He goes. And we will notice that the Spirit led to what I like to call evangelistic initiative. You see in verse 30, where he's running alongside the chariot, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? There are some of us who talk as though we should only ever start an evangelistic conversation. Well, we shouldn't actually, we should wait until we're asked. But the Spirit of God gripping hold of Philip leads Philip to take the initiative with the lost and to ask the question that it works the way in. The last thing I want to say about this business of being led by the Spirit is that we must be open to the guidance of God to change our direction. And we need to remember from Philip that we mustn't dismiss ideas because they don't fit in with what we've been doing up until this point. As we listen to one another, we must respect the fact that the Spirit of God will prompt and guide one and another of us. He was open to the Spirit's leading, sensitive to his promptings. He walked with God, in other words. Lastly, and thirdly, and the headings have come out after all, he was competent to explain scripture. Isn't this fantastic? Here's this Ethiopian Chancellor of the Exchequer reading the Isaiah scroll. Perhaps it was his souvenir of Jerusalem. And there he is reading this book, 
providentially he's got to the bit that's Isaiah 53 that we started our service with that most beautiful preaching of the cross I think in the whole Bible I shall never forget opening it out in a cafe in Nottingham once to a fellow who said I don't understand all this fuss about the cross he only read Isaiah 53 he looked up to me and said oh it's clear isn't it yeah it is it's beautifully clear there God is always ahead of his witnesses and so he was with this Ethiopian reading Isaiah 53 the Ethiopian was specially prepared specially prepared and yet not there in two respects he was a worshipper wasn't he it says he'd gone to Jerusalem to worship I guess he was a proselyte somebody converted to Judaism he was going there to worship the Lord, the living God but that's not enough, it's a good start but New Testament Christians never reckoned people were okay because they were worshipping God in their own way like many British Christians do these days worshippers like this Ethiopian need the good news about Jesus, don't they? don't be fooled by the devotion of Judaism or of Islam or of any other one God thing that worships God their way that isn't the Jesus way they need the good news of Jesus he was a worshipper, he was also a Bible reader and that's better still isn't it? it's not enough but it's a good start science people say to me, well they have the Bible in their own language let, it read it, let them read it for themselves but that's not enough here now my own wife was converted through reading the Bible she read it three times to show that it, to demonstrate to a friend that Marxism was more logical and that Christianity was a load of rubbish and by the time she finished reading it the third time she was born again an Indian friend of mine called Yudhavir worshipped the snake until he found a Bible and he started reading it Genesis and he knew it was the word of God people do from time to time get converted simply by reading this wonderful book the infallible word of God but you see you've got a very key question there in verse 31 because when Philip says do you understand what you're reading the Ethiopian says how can I unless someone explains it to me how can I understand unless someone explains it to me it's always encouraging when we distribute the scriptures isn't it I was working was it last year on a, on a, on a mission in Lachaba where we got the gospel of Luke into every house in the whole presbytery it's great to get the scriptures into people's hands but I wonder how many would say with the Ethiopian how can I understand unless someone explains it to me because there's a great need for people who can explain the Bible message in language that people can understand and so that they can see the point I'm not tonight saying there's a great need for more ministers though that may well be so but there is a great need for the people of God to be able to explain what this says in language that ordinary unconverted people can understand you see, Christianly speaking, learning is not for its own sake you learn as you sit under the ministry of the word here in the rabbinic tradition in order to be able to teach somebody and that is why when Paul assessed the Christians at Rome he said they were a good lot, Romans 15 and verse 14 because amongst other things they were competent to instruct not they had competent instructors but as individual Christians they had become competent to teach somebody else and Philip was like that he could explain Isaiah 53 to an African unbeliever just notice as we close the nature of his competence will you he started where the Ethiopian was you see that in verse 35 don't you Philip began with that very passage of scripture 
I think I may have told some of you before a rather alarming experience I had when I worked as a, as, as a student worker in England at Loughborough University. I was listening in on a conversation between somebody who had a particular way of explaining the gospel, a standard way with a booklet, and an African. And after a while the African said to the British Christian, I can't talk to you. And the British guy said, why not? And the African said, because you don't hear what I say. You hear what you think I ought to say and go on to the next point in your argument. But you don't hear what I say. Now Philip had grown up from an ABCD evangelism. You know, admit you're a sinner, believe Christ died for you, count the cost to make a decision. It's alright to start with. Or the Roman road. Romans 3, 23, 6, 23, 5, 8 and 10, 9. Look it up afterwards if you like. That's where I learnt wisdom and witnessing. But I was stuck if people wouldn't start at 3.23 with me. Now that's alright to start because we've got to start somewhere. But we've got to grow up in evangelism. Not growing away from the gospel. But you see, Philip has grown up from an ABCD and here's a man puzzling over Isaiah 53. All right, he could start there. We're concerned for speedy evangelization of the world, but speedy evangelization should not mean package evangelism, where we dump the same package on everybody. I fear it is leading to a worldwide nominalism. We must start where people are. And if you find that difficult and where somebody is starting, you say, oh goodness, I don't know how to begin there. Don't let it happen next week. Cram. Read. Ask somebody that knows a bit more. I remember once saying that the resurrection was the best attested fact of history and my heart suddenly sank with the person I was talking to. I thought, I hope he doesn't ask me to attest it for him. I thought, I speak like that through the back of my head and I can't give the evidence. And I vowed that I'd never be caught with my trousers down metaphorically like that again. And I went away and I learned the evidence for the resurrection. This is so, isn't it, that as people raise things we need to learn and be prepared. He started where the Ethiopian was. Secondly, he knew where he was going. Because verse 35 goes on, he started with that passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. If there are some Christians that are determined to do it their way and can't listen, there are others who so let the world set the agenda that they never get to the point. And if these heathen want to talk about this thing, then we'll talk about that thing. But where are we going to get to the gospel? Well, one of these days we'll probably get the bridge built and we go across. And 25 years later you say, well, we're still good friends and we've talked about everything under the sun, but we still haven't talked about Jesus. Philip was determined to share, tell the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Notice he didn't come away at the end of it and said, I had an interesting conversation with an official about possible interpretations of Isaiah. He knew where he was going. Let's get to the good news about Jesus. We need to set out with that intention. Incidentally, what is the good news? Well, what is it that we want people to know? Could you get home tonight and write it down? It's amazing how many who love the Lord, who actually, when it comes to saying, well, what is the good news, they all become tongue-tied. Well, write it down. See if you can write down an imaginary letter to somebody telling them what the good news is. Because if we're, only going, to, if we're going to aim to get the good news to people, we've got to be clear in our minds as to what it is we're wanting to get to. Do you see what I mean? and you downstairs. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> well, you see, because evangelism isn't a student hobby that we grow out of when we move downstairs. <laughs> it always thrills me when I meet people of 80 who are still bringing people to Christ. 
Dear old Mr. McClellan, he was saying, I'm dying of cancer, but I hope it's not yet because that person in the next bed's interested in the gospel. <laughs> Wonderful. Please God make many of us like it. He knew where he was going and he brought this man to commitment, didn't he? Do you see? The beginning of new life was marked by baptism and the, the Ethiopian requested it, so Philip must have spoken about the need of a new beginning. New Testament evangelism always encouraged commitment, didn't it? Paul could say, I beseech you, be reconciled to God. No, take it or leave it about it. Do the folk that we share the gospel with, if we do it, do they get the message that it's urgent? And that they are to repent and come to the Lord. That they are to make that commitment. One of my most heartbreaking experiences here was to counsel a fellow on the Isle of Lewis, a young man who worked for the post office, who said to me, I long to be saved and I just hope that one day it will happen. And as I drive around the island, I hope that one day it might happen to me. And Paul didn't say, I beseech you, brethren, hope that one day it might happen to you. He said, I beseech you, be reconciled, settle it. Because when the living God draws near, amazingly by his grace, you may reach out your hand and be brought to commitment, even you. It doesn't have to be a hope so. It can be a settled that you go on your way, like this bloke, rejoicing. And lastly, Philip had to trust the work to the Spirit. Did he? I don't know. But he had to, didn't he? Because the Spirit had another job for him to do almost immediately. The Spirit suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch didn't see him again. All right. A real work of God isn't dependent upon any person apart from God. And what he begins, he finishes. And the interesting thing is there is more evidence today of this little work with this Ethiopian than there is left today of all the revivals in Samaria and the great preachings that there were in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. Operation World again. Let me read you just a little bit. Ethiopia. Marxist Leninism is the official doctrine of the government and therefore they are opposed to all religions and dedicated to their gradual elimination. However, persecution of Christians for their faith is generally local and sporadic rather than centrally organized, but pressure on believers is steadily on the increase. 41% of the population of Ethiopia are members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church that almost certainly began with this man. Let me read you what Patrick Johnson says about that church, lest you write it off too quickly. The Orthodox Church is one of the ancient Eastern churches. It is in a state of crisis due to its inability to adjust 19th century structures to today's revolutionary realities. Marxism has created many questions in people's minds which it's unable to answer and this has helped many thousands of Orthodox Christians to a living faith in the Saviour. Churches are full and many new buildings constructed. Pray for those who love and serve the Lord within the Orthodox Church that through them blessing may come to the millions of nominal adherents. There are many evangelicals in that church it's lasted and there's a witness in that heart and torn land today that's a great encouragement for you as you witness when you're traveling isn't it great encouragement for Jamie that I was praying for is off to France to witness there with the UFM team and for others of you that get involved from time to time and you say, well, I wonder if I'll see that person again. Or where the Spirit of God has set his heart on a person. It's a very long-term work. And so we see Philip. 
And the chapter ends showing us that this wasn't a one-off business for Philip, was it? Because he developed an evangelistic lifestyle and in verse 40 there he is, travelling about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. He's not satisfied with just one convert. Now will you notice that in verse 40 there's no mention of angels and no mentions of the Spirit's voice. The Lord will lead our witness as we go. But there's no need to do nothing until we get the urge. We already have the command to go and make disciples, don't we? Let's get on with it. Let's walk with the Lord. And he'll give us special guidance when special guidance is needed. You'll be relieved that's all I wanted to say. In a moment we're going to sing a hymn and then we're going to have the benediction. And then we will probably have the usual stampede for the door. Can I suggest to you that there may be some of you who would like just to talk with the folk near you about the people that you're burdened to see one for Christ. It will be lovely if this house as well as the hall up the road should become a house of prayer. I'm not suggesting for long because poor old Billy will want to lock up and go and get his, uh, his supper at some stage. But that, as it were, if there wasn't the sort of congestion on the stairs, if some of us could just share. But if you really be sensitive if you do that, because there may be people on the inside of your row that are desperate to get out. So let's be sensitive. But let's recognise that if the Lord is speaking to us about reaching the lost as the Spirit leads us together, then we need to pray together and to encourage one another to that end. And that is why we have come to church rather than listen to the service on the radio. Because we get the encouragement not only of the ministry of the word and of the singing together, but of our mutual ministry, the one to the other, as brothers and sisters who, please God, are learning to love and to care for one another. Let's pray. Lord, take your word and all that we've talked about. Take the things that are important for us as individuals and drive them into our hearts. And we pray that you will take us as we go out into this lost world and use us stumbling as we are, as mouthpieces that others may hear the gospel. Make us like Philip, we pray. Prepared to go where the lost are able to hear your voice, willing to become competent to explain your word. For the sake of your glorious name we pray. Amen.